Hello everyone and welcome back to DBX Labs. In today's video we will be making Cisbis 5 nitrotetrazolo tetraamine cobalt 3 perchlorate, otherwise known as BNCP. Now if you're watching this video, you've likely already seen Explosions and Fires video on BNCP. He did a lengthy video on it and it was really detailed. If you haven't checked it out already, I highly recommend you do so. While he spent a lot of time on the synthesis of the compound, making two videos on that alone, I'm spending a lot of time in this video on detailing how to actually detonate it and some of its other properties that are specifically unique to it. Now BNCP is entirely different from any other energetic compounds I've worked with up until now. Rather than being composed of covalent and ionic bonds, the quote-unquote core of the molecule is a coordination complex known as cis bis 5 nitrotetrazolo tetraamine cobalt 3 This in itself is composed of the central cobalt-3 metal cation, four amine ligands, and two nitrotetrazolo ligands contributing to the 1 plus charge. Now while I have a bit of energetics experience under my belt, I had had no prior experience working with coordination complexes aside from working with tetraamine copper perchlorate. Luckily, I had a few reference documents and videos to work with, two of which came from All Chemistry, and another two came from Explosions and Fire and his other channel, Extractions and Ire. The route of synthesis I'll be using in this video is a sort of mix between the routes used in those two channels. If we look closely at our desired end compound, we see something not right. Yeah, right there. By the magic of transition metal chemistry, somehow nitrotetrazole is now not one, but two ligands in our compound. Now the real question is how do we place those as cobalt ligands? We do this by utilizing the carbonato ligand which acts as a placeholder that we can later decompose in an acidified solution. Once decomposed we can throw on two nitrotetrazoles as nitrotetrazolo ligands and since carbonato is bidentate it leaves open two spots for this. The first step of the synthesis is to make the carbonato tetraamine cobalt 3 complex which we form as the sulfate. We do this by reacting a solution of 36.1 grams of cobalt sulfate heptahydrate in 80 milliliters of water with another solution of 190 milliliters of 25% ammonia, 300 milliliters of water, and 77 grams of ammonium bicarbonate. Adding the basic ammonia into our cobalt solution precipitates out a large amount of cobalt hydroxide that redissolves back into solution as our pretty purple complex. At this point, the carbonato and amine ligands have replaced the aqua ligands on the cobalt. To oxidize that cobalt cation into cobalt-3, we have to add 10 milliliters of 35% hydrogen peroxide slowly. From the looks of it, the solution is a little bit darker, and now we boil the solution for 2 hours down to 250 milliliters. During this, we periodically add more ammonium bicarbonate. Nice. All in all, I used about 30 grams during the two hour period. Refrigerating the solution overnight yields really nice crystals of our complex at the bottom. When we weigh out the crystals, we find that the yield was just above 17 grams, so we take 16 of those grams, and in the next step, we'll be reacting them with 16 grams of sodium perchlorate in a metathesis reaction. This reaction is as simple as dissolving the two compounds into water and reacting them together at an elevated temperature. We immediately see small crystals of the perchlorate salt start forming on the surface of the solution, so we take it off heating and put it in the fridge. After several hours of cooling, we see that more of the perchlorate salt of the complex has precipitated out. We weigh this out to be a little bit more than 15 grams, just over the 14 grams that we need for the next step. In the next step, we take this and dissolve it into 10% perchloric acid, which decomposes the carbonato ligand into carbon dioxide and leaves us with two open spots for ligand placement. We fill these spots by taking a solution of 26.5 grams of sodium nitrotetrazolate in water and slowly adding it into the solution. After doing this, we take the beaker with the combined solutions and put it onto a hot plate in a double boiler. The last chemical reaction to take place in the synthesis is the placement of the nitrotetrazolo ligands, and that takes about four hours in this boiling solution. Over time, we see that the color changes from a darkish purple to more of an orange color, which is hard to see because there's a large volume of the liquid, but if you pipette out some of the solution periodically, you'll see that the color change is a bit more dramatic, and by the end we see that it's pretty much all orange, or reddish orange. 
I had to add some water into both the double boiler and the solution over the course of the four hours to act as a sort of reflux. But after the four hours is up, we just start boiling the solution down to precipitate out our BNCP. Even when thoroughly dried, this crude BNCP is clearly impure. It doesn't burn consistently and looks more like an amorphous powder than anything crystalline. However, since BNCP is so insoluble in water, even hot water, we have to dissolve it into 1% perchloric acid to do a recrystallization. Even still, it takes a good amount of hot solution to dissolve all the BNCP. And once it is all dissolved, I take it off heating and put aluminum foil all around the beaker to insulate it and help slow down the rate of cooling and hopefully to optimize the growth of large crystals. Little did I know just how large those crystals would get. I woke up to find massive crystals in that beaker and they were beautiful and terrifying. Large crystals and energetics generally do not go well together. However, since this is one of the most insensitive commercially used primaries, I'm not as concerned about the crystal size, yet it is still something that you have to take into consideration. Luckily, I do have some smaller crystals of BNCP from a previous synthesis, and those do help me a lot in the actual testing of the BNCP, as the large crystals don't do a good job of explaining the sensitivity as a powder-like substance. Okay, we got the end compound. That part of the video is over. Now let's look into the properties. Where to start? It's only the most reasonable thing to test it out on foil first, so we put it on some foil and heat it from above and underneath. Here we see a very interesting property of the large crystals that only appears with the large crystals. When heated from underneath, they ignite and propel themselves into the air like little rocket motors. Igniting the BNCP with a direct flame fares similarly for both the small and large crystals, and they burn quite rapidly, but it's really not much different from other stuff like, like tetraamine copper perchlorate. Another property unique to BNCP, however, is that it is thermochromic. I haven't read any literature supporting this, but it doesn't take much to look at the BNCP being heated by underneath and notice that it changes from an orange color to a red color, and then with heating removed, it turns back to an orange color. It's harder to see this with the large crystals, that's why I don't show it, but it is visible to the naked eye. Now we bring out the 50 pound anvil and it's time to do some sensitivity testing. You'll never be as good as lead azide. As long as you don't get too critical of its performance in front of it, BNCP makes for one of the most safe primaries used in detonators today. Now that I'm back from my break working with nitro tetrazole salts, of course we're going to have to do some can tests. Thank you. 
So of the four cans, we know that only two of them successfully detonated, and that was the BNCP with the Silver Nitro Tetrazol Primer and the Pure Silver Nitro Tetrazol. What this tells us is really that the BNCP on its own won't detonate with just a fuse alone. Uh, I think that mainly has to do with the pressure buildup, although it could just be that it's not easy to detonate it with uh, just pure flame ignition, uh, even if you did contain it. I'll have to do some more testing to find that out. But it does appear that when the BNCP does have a igni initiating primer, like silver nitro tetrazol, even if it's a really small amount, in this I only used one milligram of silver nitro tetrazol, it does fully initiate it. And I'd say that both the silver nitro tetrazol and the BNCP were on par with one another at that 50 milligram amount. And um, they did a significant amount of damage to the cans. You can see with the BNCP, like Explosions and Fire touched on in his video, that the BNCP has a very high detonation velocity. It's over 5,000 meters per second. I believe it's even closer to 6,000 meters per second. And you can see all this damage that happened at the back. And those are supersonic little pieces of aluminum that were ripped out of the front side, accelerated, and shot through the back. And it just shows you the, the raw power that occurs in such a small... Um, radius of the detonation site and that's what creates all those small little uh, pieces of aluminum same can be said about the silver nitro touchers all over here although we don't really see as many of those exit holes while using a small amount of silver nitro tetrazol to initiate bncp is a surefire way to ensure complete detonation it does negate the entire point of using BNCP as an insensitive primer. Since we know that BNCP can't be detonated with just a fuse, we have to look at alternative methods to set it off. Luckily, BNCP is known for its alternative methods of initiation, including laser ignition and bridge wire detonators. While focusing my 532 nanometer 50 milliwatt green laser pointer is enough to show decomposition of the BNCP crystals, it isn't nearly the size of a laser we need to actually detonate the BNCP. That leaves us with our last option being the bridge wire detonator. A bridge wire detonator functions by surging a large amount of current through a very small wire causing it to detonate. This large amount of current comes from a capacitor bank and typically you have to have a pretty high voltage capacitor bank to ensure that once the bridge wire detonates there is still a plasma that conducts electricity and continues the heating of that plasma so it detonates more and more rapidly. Interestingly, bridge wire detonators were first used in the Manhattan Project when they were used to detonate the PETN surrounding Trinity, the first nuclear device. The spherical assortment of charges would detonate simultaneously, ensuring that the plutonium core at the center would compress and reach criticality. While making a bridge wire detonator may seem like a daunting project in and of itself, I found a way to construct one for less than $50 made out of 9 volt batteries and the capacitors found in disposable flash cameras. This capacitor bank holds up to 100 joules when fully charged and can release it all at once at up to 200 volts. I configured some bridge wires out of regular wiring with a piece of filament wrapped in between, and these seem to work pretty well. Setting off the bridge wire is deafening. It's almost as loud as a gunshot, and I have a feeling it will work quite well setting off our BNCP.
So clearly the bridge wire does work in setting off the BNCP. Not only that, it is extremely consistent and in all of my trials using the BNCP in combination with the bridge wire, it successfully detonates. Now I actually designed an even better version of this BNCP primer, however I don't really think that's the best idea to put it up on YouTube. This revised version of the BNC primer is up on my Patreon if you want to see how it works. They incorporate some amino nitroguanidine nitrate into the design so it boosts the 5000 meter per second detonation velocity of the BNCP into 9500 meters per second. This makes them a lot more powerful, plus the design is a lot less flimsy as the duct tape, so it becomes safer as well. If you guys liked this video, please do like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video.